I've always been fascinated by science. Well, let me qualify that. I've been fascinated by science from the moment I stopped studying it at school. So, I don't know what, whether that says more about me or about science education, but you may wonder what design has to do with science. And um, I think that design and science, the intersection, is where social change, one of the points where social change happens. So, three years ago, almost to the, to the day, I had the great pleasure of being invited to Korea by a Zaibatsu, one of these large mega corporations. And they, they wanted us to tell them what the future was going to be like. Which is kind of strange because actually Korea is the future. When you go there, it's like you've landed in Blade Runner. So, of course, this says more about science fiction than about the reality of the future because we always get predictions of the future wrong. It's very hard to extrapolate the future when all we know is what is around us now. So this picture is from 1951. Uh, the Rand Corporation created this image to tell us what the home computer of 2001 was going to be like. <laughs> you can see it's very familiar. You know, we all have these in other so they got it wrong. They got it really wrong because they couldn't imagine the seismic changes that would happen in the next 50 years. All they could do was draw a linear plot from where they were now. The ir ironic thing about this image is actually it's a fake. That's a submarine, nuclear submarine uh, cockpit in the Smithsonian Institute. But the, the funny thing is we can, we can fake the human context, the social context, which is crucial. So having said all of that, <laughs> I'm going to make a prediction now. Um, we are rapidly approaching the age of the extended human. Um, what does this mean? Well, there are four, there are four extensions, but the, the essence is that we have achieved the means to escape from organic evolution. This may seem like a very science fiction idea or something that is far off, but actually it's been happening for at least 4,000 years. So evolution, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to condense it into its absolute essence. Evolution is the way that organisms become more complicated. And they do that by passing information from one to another, initially through DNA, and then, and then through um, things called brains, and then language, and then writing, and so on. Because at some point, the amount of information needed to be passed exceeded the capacity of the simple encoding within DNA. I think one DNA string fills an entire library, more or less, of information. So all we're doing is continuing this natural progression of, of complexity, of increasing complexity. And we're now using external means, very visible external means, to accelerate that. So genetic engineering, nanotechnology, computers, the internet. Genetic engineering, I, I was once told that genetic engineering is like throwing metal and concrete into a river and calling it a bridge. So we're a long way off, but synthetic biology is much closer to achieving what we need to do, which is effectively building DNA at the molecular level up to truly design. So, as I said before, there are four ways in which we'll be extended. Firstly, extended lifespans. So it's important to draw a distinction here between life expectancy and lifespan. Life expectancy has increased from more or less 40 years to high 70s. 
Hans Rosling can tell you a lot more about that. Um, but that's been as a consequence of sanitation, medical technology, healthcare, uh, etc., and the development of cities. Extended lifespan, this is a whole different game. Um, our actual lifespan hasn't really moved on much. It's about 120 years. But technology is being researched now that will, at some point, enable us to live much, much longer lives. And this has enormous consequences. You know, firstly, where do all the people go? There's already a lot of us around. So um, this, this a potential to extend our lifespans will, will impact us all. And as designers, we need to think about how we address these issues uh, of a larger aging population and, and also uh, how we need to change as a society. Um, we can't retire at 70 anymore if we live to 400. And in fact, some people are saying we're approaching escape velocity. So, i.e. the singularity, the vertical curve, where some children may be born today who will never die. Quite an interesting thought. Um, extended intelligence. So, our brains have more or less reached their biological limit. They can't get any bigger. It's to do with heat loss and how much energy is required. So we were quite clever. We invented writing and language, and this is a way of externalizing our intelligence. Um, this is becoming more and more sophisticated. You all already outsource your thinking every day. Uh, there's a nice comic, XKCD, which I recommend you all check out. It's a geeky web comic, and, and it says, every time Wikipedia crashes, my apparent IQ drops by 30 points. So um, this is going to get more and more sophisticated and less, less um, intrusive. You won't be clicking on a mouse anymore. A part of your brain will be going off and interfacing with some system somewhere and coming back with the answer that you were thinking about. Extended sensing, number three. Um, this is uh, an amplification and an addition to all the sensors that we think of as being our normal, natural senses. Um, you know, we can't see in sonar, or we can't perceive sonar, but many creatures can. Uh, we can't see uh, infrared spectrum. There's no reason why we have these limitations beyond just the adaptation we've made to our, to our environment. But these things can all be enhanced. By smelling a glass of wine, you might be able to tell what year it was uh, uh, made and where the soil that it grew, the grapes grew in was. And then finally, extended physical capabilities. So this is, uh, you know, superhero stuff. What would be interesting is what happens to athletics. Uh, they may be not competitions between countries anymore, but between pharmaceutical companies all competing with their own brand of genetically modified athlete. So that's the context. Now, what do we do? This is just information. Um, so as designers, we start by thinking about people, about the human context. That's where we always start. Um, when we work with industry and with governments and with science, it's the designer's job to bring the human context in because it's only by doing that that you can create new products and services that are meaningful and actually uh, useful to people in their lives. We also try and bring in some aspect of moral value to something that may not initially have any moral value, either positive or negative. So I'm going to show you a series of, of not design solutions, but provocations, I like to call them. Uh, and there's a few people in this audience here, um, amongst many in, in my team, who, whose genius led to this. It's, it's, this is, I'm just on stage showing it, but uh, this is the work of quite a few very clever people. So uh, what, first provocation, first product provocation, emotional skin. So uh, the idea of this is that you spray a thin film of uh, nano sensors onto your skin. Uh, you cover your body in this. And uh, then when you're having a nice time, when you're relaxing on the beach, your body will 
send out various signals in many ways through endorphins and blood flow and, and so on, heart rate, pulse. And, and this emotional skin will capture that, will record that sensation. And then later on when you're back at work, stressing out, uh, your emotional skin will replay those feelings of, of pleasure and calm you down. I think I could do with that now. Uh, so next, next provocation. So we're going to modify our bodies. There's no, it, it, it's, you know, humans love modifying their bodies. Uh, but we're going to be able to do some incredibly weird things uh, coming soon. And it's not like the Borg. It's not going to be uh, sticking, you know, uh, you know, machines into us exactly, but, but possibly. And uh, one idea we've considered is that you can embed your social network uh, messaging system into your, into your hand, into your skin. Uh, subcutaneous uh, uh, cells can change color to indicate that you've got a new Facebook update. Um, and, then how do, and then you can display your status through your hair. So it can change color, it can change length, maybe it can flash on and off. And uh, then, of course, the next obvious thing is interacting. So, uh, again, by making physical gesture, you can uh, actually get all your information in your hand. Yeah, the, all this physical gadget stuff, that's, that's a, it's going away, it's a fad. And, uh, and then most beautifully of all, I think, is the idea that we can reclaim these uh, uh, metaphorical gestures that we make in our social networks and turn them back into physical gestures, which is where they came from. So instead of a like button, you actually just need to do that to a real object in real space. Another surgery that we were considering, uh, is something I, I think would be really useful, uh, is, is having a chip in your tooth that can tell you when you're eating something that isn't good for you. And it can uh, make an alarm sound and tell you you really shouldn't be eating that. Our original idea was that it actually clamped your mouth shut <laughs> so you couldn't eat any more, but maybe a bit extreme. And then it can play back the sound recording of your, of your diet and then your doctor can see <laughs> you're about to uh, get ill or lose a tooth and, and warn you about it. Um, one of the big issues of aging is memory. We, we're able now to uh, think about things that can help us with memory. We're getting to the point where we can record everything forever. Total history, as Charlie Strauss calls it. So in this scenario, um, uh, the grandma is seeing her granddaughter playing with a ball. She's very happy. That sensation of happiness causes the glasses to record the event. And then when she's sad or lonely or forgetful, then the glasses can replay the event and she can uh, re-experience that emotion. And this would be great for Alzheimer's as well because um, you could actually enhance the information around someone when you see them. Because one of the big problems is with Alzheimer's is you forget who someone is like, time and time and time again. And, and it causes great distress. Some more interesting social context. Uh, diseases. We're, we're creating lots of diseases. As you probably, if you listen out and you read the newspapers, there's lots of disease uh, innovation happening <laughs> around the world because diseases evolve way better than we do. They're way better at evolution. So um, here we have an embedded chip that tells you when you're getting ill. And then if you're getting really ill, it's actually telling you you need to stay in this zone in the city. We don't want this disease spreading. So this is not exactly necessarily a very positive uh, event, but, but if you get really sick, then perhaps it confines you to your, to your house. And this might be the way we need to stop these very dangerous avian flus spreading in future. I'm not saying it's going to be nice, but it may be necessary. Um, and then the final one, which I, I think is quite amusing, is, is um, at some point we will eradicate con con communicable diseases, contagious diseases, unquestionably. And um, maybe we'd like to actually nostalgically look back and see what it was like to have the c a cold. So this little app allows you to download your own customized virus, and then you drink it, and then you can go to a party and hang out with people who have the plague. It only lasts a couple of hours, don't worry, but uh, 
that's one of the more outliers. So I think what the point I made earlier is that technology is actually amoral. I think that's a provocative statement because, because we, you know, you could talk about science funding and, and, and what actually gets prioritized, but in essence, uh, a science, uh, a scientist is thinking about a solution to, to, a, to a kind of technical problem, not to a human problem. And, and, and what determines its moral value is how we use that technology. And um, we're actually on the cusp of creating two species. And this is, a, this is a, an issue we need to discuss and think about. Because this is, if we think that the inequalities in the world are big now, when this stuff happens that I was showing you, um, it's going to be a chasm, a, uh, an enormous divide between those that can afford it and those that can't. Because this stuff is not going to be given free benevolently by, by lovely, happy governments. This is going to be sold as products. And we need to understand the impact of that. Um, we could go the way of Neanderthal and Homo sapiens if we, don't, if we aren't very careful about how we enhance ourselves. The counterpoint is that this might be limited Darwinian thinking. Species have only, only existed for one billion years. That sounds like a long time. Um, but for three billion years previously, there were no species. DNA was passed promiscuously between organisms. Um, and it's possible that through genetic engineering and, and these new sciences, we will be returning to this promiscuous world where there isn't really this define, uh, defining line between species, but there's this incredible uh, flowering of diversity. But the final point I'd like to make is that um, we're standing at the edge of a huge ocean, and um, we don't know what's out there, but like Magellan, we are compelled to cross that ocean because at the end, we are human. Thank you.